Hello students. Now here, in this particular short discussion, we want to see what kind of lessons can be learnt for mains 2024 from the question paper of 2023 that is especially with respect to anthropology. And today I am going to discuss paper 1 of 2023. What kind of derivatives can we make? What kind of indications can be seen? Will there be any sort of tracing that can be done and how is it going to help us to steer our preparation for 2024 mains which is going to be starting from September 20th. So in that context, if you ask me sir, what are the different kinds of lessons that can be learned by looking or by analyzing the paper from 2021 or 2023 anthropology paper 1. You see that the first thing that we'll have to understand is any given day for anthropology PYQs are the king. They are the king for the reason that when you look at this paper most of the question at least if you have done the PYQs for last 8 years if you have a, the written answers and if you have steered your preparation on the basis of PYQs you would have had the basic conceptual clarity definitely you could have attempted 210 to 220 out of 250 with comfort that is one particular observation that has to be learnt by looking at 2023 question paper for 2024 means in the context of anthropology as an option so one is the PYQs is going to play a major role the second thing that we will have to understand is UPSC when it was giving certain questions for example the environmental conservations or when the question with respect to rules of marriage or with respect to the question on Taong baby or it might be the question with respect to Arjun Appadurai and globalization or it might be with respect to qualitative research methodologies and the corresponding softwares which are being used now from all of such questions in the context of paper 1 we see that UPSC was expecting a kind of conceptual clarity with respect to the subject it was expecting a kind of conceptual clarity not only with respect to the kind of conceptual clarity that was demanded from the side of the subject the third thing that it was seeing is it wanted to bring in a dynamic element with respect to anthropology as an option because it has been misconceived and there is a lot of misconception that goes on with respect to this particular optional that this optional is very static but you have to understand that number of dynamic elements are fundamentally seen with respect to this optional for example the softwares which are used that is one dynamism the Ogbans concept of cultural lack one dynamism because there was number of debate that was going on with respect to in India we see a phenomena called as urbanization without urbanism urbanization without urbanism and one particular debate has been going on with respect to going communal rights going communal conflicts going caste conflicts in urban centers that means we see the material culture has been advancing but the, tech, but the ideological dimensions are lagging behind and in this context when number of articles were given we see cultural lag appearing in the question paper when we look at glottochronology or when we look at the question on Rakhi Ghari that is with respect to the significance of Rakhi Ghari now in all of these questions we observe that there is dynamism which was expected from the side of UPSC so in that context one thing that we will have to definitely understand is we will have to revise our PYQs for preparing for 2024 examination we need to have a good grip on the PYQs for at least last 6 to 8 years. The second thing that we will have to understand is having the conceptual clarity. Now in this conceptual clarity you have to understand that how well are we going to link paper 1 along with the concepts of paper 2. For example if you look at in paper 1 we study about demographic theories. In paper 2 we study about Indian demography there is a correlation that is existing. For example in the context of the physical anthropology we talk about sickle cell anemia. And in the context of 6.2 of paper 2, we study about the health problems with respect to tribes or G6PD's deficiency that is existing with respect to the tribal areas of Chhattisgarh or Chota Nagpur Plateau. So in that context, what we have to understand is we need this conceptual clarity to interlink paper 1 and paper 2. We also see an element of dynamism which has to be seen that is especially by stating the current affairs. 
by stating the current affairs, by stating the certain articles, certain research articles which is to maximize the score. Now without basic understanding about the learnings from 2023 question paper for with respect to the optional preparation of 2024 mains examination, we'll just have a brief discussion about this particular paper and we'll see what forms of analysis can be seen with respect to this particular question paper. Now when we look at the first question, that is, it is asking about the scope and relevance of the social and cultural anthropology. We know the scope and relevance, scope fundamentally means all of the syllabus that we see with respect to the socio-cultural anthropology, be it marriage, be it family, be it kinship, be it political organization, be it economic organization, be it religion. In all of these things, what do we study? We see that is what is the scope of socio-cultural anthropology. Right? And if you are able to talk about the relevance of each of this with respect to the current understandings, maybe with respect to dynamism in marriage, dynamism in family, dynamism in kinship, or dynamism with respect to political organizations, or maybe the observations of K. Sharma there, or maybe with respect to the religion and the corresponding dynamism with respect to religion, like a concepts of secularization of religion. So this is what is the relevance with respect to the socio-cultural anthropology. That is what is the first question. Then second, it is asking about what is the cultural impact of Iron Age. Now when we look at Iron Age, we know fundamentally with the advent of iron, we see that the metal had the necessary strength in clearing forest. Now when we had the necessary strength in clearing forest, we see that we were able to engage in agricultural activity. With agricultural activity, we see there is agricultural surplus which has been emerging. With agricultural surplus, we see two systems categorically emerging in this context. One is the economic systems, the other one is the political systems. We see that in the context of economic systems, it might be with the aspect of trade. It might be with respect to aspect of taxation. It might be with respect to the aspects of uh, the stratification which is existing. Now, on all of this basis, we see one peculiar dimension to be emerging, that is the concept of urbanization to be coming into the picture. Now, when we look at the political dimension, when we look at the political dimension, we see the political administration came into the picture. It might be the central, it might be provincial, it might be revenue, it might be judicial, it might be military. Those dimensions started coming into the picture. Now, from there, we see the warfare as a phenomena starts emerging. So we see that number of cultural impacts were existing with respect to Iron Age and we see a similar question was present with respect to 2018 paper. That was in 2018 it was a 15 marker, now here it is a 10 marker. Now when we look at the next question, that is race and ethnicity. Now here we bring in the percep perceptions of the T.H. Erickson's. T.H. Erickson's perceptions with respect to race and ethnicity. Now in this context we will have to see race versus ethnicity as one dimension and what is the converging element with respect to race and ethnicity. Now because in the context of race we see it is more of a biological dimension. It might be with respect to the nature of the hair, it might be with respect to the nature of the color, it might be with respect to the nature of the eye that is maybe presence of epicanthic fold or the absence of epicanthic fold. And we also see ethnicity need not be on the basis of race. Ethnicity is a multifold phenomena. It might be derived out of religion, it might be derived out of caste, it might be derived out of culture. There are different dimensions which are existing. We see a kind of folk taxonomies coming into the picture. So in that context, one dimension is you will have to discuss about race versus ethnicity. The second dimension that you will have to discuss about is what is the common element that is existing between race and ethnicity. So that is one dimension that has to be seen with respect to this particular question. Now when we look at the next question that is customary laws and environmental conservation. A very very similar question was seen with respect to 2021 where there was a question on deep ecology. There was a question on deep ecology. Now in this context when you talk about the customary laws, we can fundamentally discuss about animism. Right? We can discuss about animism. We can discuss about sacred groups, right? So that particular dimension was seen. This is what is actually making the paper little dynamic. This is what is actually making the paper little dynamic and it is also seeking an element of conceptual clarity. That is what is supposed to be written there. Now when we look at the next question that is gene expression. Now when we look at gene expression, one thing that we'll have to understand when we talk about this gene expression. Now we know that in the context of gene expression, it can be of two types, either it is monogenic or it is polygenic expression. 
Now, when we look at this monogenic expression, what do we see? We see either it is in the context of dominance or recessive, or either it might be in the context of co-dominance, or either it might be in the context of incomplete dominance. Now, when we look at the polygenic expression, now in the context of polygenic expression, we majorly talk about the concepts of epigenetics. We majorly talk about the concepts of epigenetics to a larger extent. Now, here we can also bring in the dimension with respect to gene imprinting. We can bring in the concept of gene imprinting that can be seen with respect to 9.4. That is where we study about the chromosomal abnormalities which is existing. And not only that, we can also bring in the concepts of heritability. Because here we see not only the concepts of heritability can be brought in, we can talk about the quantitative and qualitative traits. Where we see the genotype is impacting the phenotype. It is not only the genotype which is impacting the phenotype, we see in the polygenic dimension, there is an element of gene and environment in combination. Gene and environment in combination. So in that context, we see both the qualitative as well as quantitative traits of an individual. That is where we talk about this gene expression. And we can bring in the dynamism that is with respect to gene imprinting. And one classic example of gene imprinting is Kredushat. Is Kredushat with respect to the fifth chromosome that is existing. So that can be discussed. That can be discussed in this context. Moving on. Next question. Now, in fact, this is what is a direct question. It is asking about Australopithecus. And one small dynamism that they taught was Tawang baby. So it is nothing but one of those primary fossils which was seen with respect to Australopithecus was Tawang baby. So this was more of a direct question and it was more of a repeated question with respect to your previous year questions. Now moving to the second, discuss the Paleolithic environment in the light of available evidences with special references to India. Now when we look at this particular question has been derived in multiple formats be it in 2019 or be it in 2020 or be it in 2021, we see this particular question occurring. It might be from paper 1 or paper 2. It might be from paper 1 or paper 2 because in 1.1 and 1.2 of paper 1 and 1.8 of paper 1.1 and 1.2 of paper 2 and 1.8 of paper 1, we see this archaeological convergence existing there. So in that context, what do you observe here? Now here you have to understand that during this Paleolithic period, during this Paleolithic period, we see there can be there are generally two kinds of systems which are existing. One is the glacial systems. This was majorly seen in the context of northern India because they asked special reference to India. Now the second dimension that is the pluvial aspects in the context of southern India. And we know with such variation of the environments which are existing, the nature of the flora that is existing, the nature of the fauna that is existing will vary. And we see that the nature of the fossils that were existing it might be or the nature of the archaeological methodologies which are used maybe in the context of relative dating or absolute dating. In all of these dimensions we see a sort of variation that is existing. And we also know that environment determines the culture. Environment determines the culture. That is what is one fundamental observation that can be seen with respect to when we look at the ecological approach or culture ecology approach that has been given. So in that context, this is what is one fundamental understanding that, been, that can be seen with respect to that particular question. Next, moving on. Yes. Now, elucidate the different forms of malnutrition. Describe protein, calorie, malnutrition with suitable examples. Again, uh, this is kind of question from a combination of one epidemiological anthropology of 9.8. And not only that, we also see the concepts of growth and development and nutritional anthropology. We see these three converging for you to have this particular question. Now, in this particular question, if you observe, we see that when we talk about malnutrition, we see that there are different kinds of expression of malnutrition, either in the context of overnutrition, either in the context of undernutrition, or either in the context of micronutrition. Now, when I look at the overnutrition, it might be obesity, the concepts of thrifty gene, it might be with respect to obesity or the concepts of thrifty gene. That is what we see, right? O'Neill. O'Neill's concept of thrifty gene is what is observed in the context of overnutrition. Then apart from that, we also talk about undernutrition. In undernutrition, we talk about kwashiorkor, marasmus. Then it might be with respect to the stunting or wasting, right? So that is one dimension that can be seen. Then apart from that, micronutrition variation or the micronutrition in that context, talk about vitamins, talk about minerals. Right? So in general studies, we talk about the concept of hunger and hidden hunger. This micro dimension is more of an hidden hunger dimension which can be seen here. And if you want to just bring in some element of dynamism, we can talk about the global hunger index. 
we can talk about the global hunger index in this context because global hunger index is an indicative element of the malnourishment that is existing among number of children that is present in India or in the globe. So that is one particular dimension that can be brought in and you can even talk about the growth and developmental studies. You can even talk about the growth and developmental studies with respect to this. It might be that understanding the longitudinal and cross-sectional methodologies of understanding the growth and development, you will be able to arrive at the malnutrition. For example, when you look at Indian context of ICDS, in the context of ICDS, we use more of a mixed methodology with respect to understanding or studying the growth and development. So that is one particular dynamic element that you can bring in with respect to this particular question. Next. Ah, third question that it is asking about what is hominization process right that means it is asking about what is the formation of hominin right then hominization process discuss the major trends with respect to suitable examples now in any hominization process I know it's a two-way process when I look at hominization process it is a two-way process because I observe that in the context of hominization process two things are very very definite one is the bipedal structure the other one that I definitely see is non-honing chewing. Non-honing chewing. Now in this context in the bipedal structure, I see the skeletal changes to be existing to a larger extent. It might be in the context of foramen magnum. It might be in the context of the medial arches. It might be in the context of the uh, backbone or it might be in the context of vertebral column. It might be in the context of pelvic region. So in all of these regions, what do we observe? We see a corresponding change existing with respect to bipedal. It might be with respect to the median arch. It might be with respect to gluteus, gluteus maximus, gluteus minimus. It might be linear aspera, emergence of the linear aspera we see majorly during the periods of homo erectus. So that can be discussed with respect to this particular dimension. Now when we look at non-honing, it is majorly with respect to face and skull variation because we see that the variation that was existing with respect to diastema. Or maybe the variation that is existing with respect to orthognathic and prognathic structure. Or it might be with respect to the, the aspects of canine and incisor sizes. Or it might be with respect to what is the nature of the size, what is the axis of the face that is existing. Right? So it might be with respect to all of these dimensions is what is observed here. Or we talk about the masticatory muscles which are existing. So all of these dimensions started changing because of non hoing chewing. So these dimensions has to be discussed when, it, when you talk about the hominization process, the corresponding changes, the corresponding evolutions. Maybe you can talk about the energy dispensation mechanism when you talk about the bipedal structure. Because in 2021, we had one particular question that what are the losses due to bipedal structure? What are the losses due to erect posture? Maybe that particular dimension you can link in. That is what I was telling that PYQs or understanding having a grip over PYQs are extremely important for optional like anthropology. So that has to be understood to a larger extent in this particular context. Next, moving on. We know Victor Turner and Clifford Grease are some of the very, very favorite individuals with, with respect to UPSC. Now it is asking about the Clifford Gates understanding with respect to religion. And when we look at the Clifford Gates understanding with respect to religion, what do we observe? We know that Gates talks about religion being a system of symbol which are powerful and pervasive and which motivates a general order of existence in the society. Now in that context, what do we observe? We see that we have number of concepts of Gates which were previously asked, for example, liminality, for example, communitas, for example, thick description in 2021. So in 2020, we had rights the passage, we had liminality being asked. In 2016, we had rights the passage. So in that context, what do we commonly observe? We see Gates and Turner have been one of the important aspects. So when you look at the Kifford Gates understanding of religion, this is what is the basic definition of religion. Then he also talks about different thresholds. Threshold of evil, threshold of suffering and threshold of knowledge. Right. So this is what is the basic understanding. And the second part of the question is differentiate between the anthropological and psychological approaches. Now in this context, you need not be confused because anthropological might be evolutionary approach. That is where we study about animism, animatism, fetishism, naturism, right, monotheism, polytheism, that kind of evolution that is existing. Then the second dimension or second aspect of anthropological is it can be the functional aspect, right. So maybe we can differentiate evolutionary versus psychological, functional versus psychological. So this is what is one basic interpretation of this particular question that can be derived. So that is question number 3b. Now moving to the next question that is 3C. It is a straightforward question. 
In 2019, we had longitudinal methods and cross-sectional methods which were asked directly. The advantages, the disadvantages, the pros, the cons were asked. But in this particular context, they are asking about mixed longitudinal method. So when I mix this long, longitudinal as well as the cross-sectional method, I have the mixed longitudinal method which has its own advantages, which has its own disadvantages which are existing. So that is to be written in this context, a straightforward question, right? And in fact, you see that United States follows in the context of maintaining the nutrition among children, they follow a number of these studies. They follow a number of these studies with respect to the study of growth and development. Next fourth question they are asking about, discuss the role of marriage regulations in traditional societies in India to ensure social solidarity. Again, this is to bring in a dynamic element with respect to the anthropology as a subject. We study number of rules of marriages, it might be endogamy, exogamy, hypergamy, hypogamy, incest taboo. It might be caste endogamy, it might be village exogamy or it might be village endogamy. We see number of systems or rules of marriage which are existing. And we see that how is it building the social solidarity? It might be through exchanges as well. It might be through exchanges, it might be uncle niece, it might be cross cousin, it might be parallel cousin. So what is happening is we see number of such systems are existing in this context. So we will have to discuss about those, those dimensions here. It's a 10, 20 marker and you will have to, if you bring in one one type of or one one kind of rule and the corresponding social solidarity mechanism, how is it doing? It can be done. Then discuss various methods of personal identification based on skeletal remains, right? It is talking about the facial reconstruction. It might be method, mathematical models, non-mathematical models which are existing with respect to these reconstructions. It is asking about how do you determine the age? How do you determine the sex? How do you determine the race? So all of these dimensions are what are being asked with respect to the personal identification. Right? So that can be written here. Then identify the major Mesolithic sites and describe the typo technological features with special reference. Now we know Mesolithic has been one of the very very favorite areas with respect to UPSC. You believe it or not every year there is question on Mesolithic which is definitely existing maybe in paper 1 or maybe in paper 2 or it might be the Mesolithic cultures of Europe or it might be the Mesolithic cultures in India. Now we know one of the categorical features in the context of Mesolithic is Mesolithic as a phenomena is an intermediary phase. It is a transitionary phase and it is a transitionary phase purely because there is a transition in the climate which has been happening. Right? There is a shift from the glacial systems to the pluvial systems to a larger extent and in that intermediate we see number of transitionary phenomena emerging. It might be moving from hunting and gathering to in the context of maybe the wild food grain collection or it might be moving towards domestication or it might be moving towards crude pottery or handmade pottery. So all of these systems as a phenomena started emerging and we see these are transitionary between Paleolithic and Neolithic to a larger extent. Now in that basic understanding when you observe it is asking about typo technologies we know when we look at the nature of the tools that are existing this is characterized by microliths as well as the composite tools which are existing. The microliths and the composites which are existing and apart from that we can also see it can be divided into three different types. One is the crude geometric type, the other one is highly geometric type, the other one is non-geometric type. And when we look at these different kinds of tools which are existing, we see the non-geometric type fundamentally existing in Sangan Kallu region of Karnataka, majorly in the southern part. Now when we look at the crude geometric, we see it might be in the context of Langnach or Bhimbetka or Belan Valley, all of these are characterized with crude geometric tools. Now when I look at geo, geom, purely geometric or highly geometric, that is where I see with respect to the Bagor region. The Bagor region of Rajasthan, that is where we observe this kind of transitionary phenomena that is existing. So this is what is to be written in this particular question. Next, moving further. It is asking about polygenic inheritance. Now when we talk about polygenic, that means multiple factors are becoming for an expression of a particular character. It might be in the context of race, it might be with, with, with respect to in the context of hair or skin or eye color or we know one of the classic examples that we talk about is the example of mulatto and we talk about this distribution curve, right? The, the inverted U curve that we talk about or the bulge that we talk about. So this can be written with respect to polygenic inheritance. It's an exception to the Mendelian characteristic feature is what is supposed to be remembered. Next, prehistoric significance of Rakhi Gari. Now when we look at this prehistoric significance of Rakhi Gari, it's a very, very important site in understanding Aryan migration. It's a very, very important site for us to understand the cultural continuity that has been existing from the sides of the Indus Valley towards till today. And not only that, it also indicates the dimensions of cultural evolutions, cultural systems which are existing during this IVC period. So in that context, we can talk about 
all of these different dimensions which are existing with respect to Rakhi Gari because we see this has been in current affairs from 2021 we see number of excavations number of uh, things were which were being talked and we also see BB Lal was conferred with number of awards with respect to the such, such kind of excavations to a larger extent then glottochronology now when you look at glottochronology this is one kind of question which troubled most of the aspirants but in this context one simple thing that you'll have to see is glottochronology is a kind of practice that is seen with respect to historic linguistics right we know different kinds of branches are existing with respect to linguistic anthropology historic linguistics structural linguistics so in that context what do we observe we see historical linguistics the, is, is the glottochronology is one of those historic linguistics and when we look at one simple example that we can see is sanskrit having a kind of convergence with the european languages maybe during the era of the Asiatic Society of Bengal, maybe with respect to the William Jones, maybe Max Muller, all of these individuals have used such kind of glottochronology as a phenomenon. Then, menopausal symptoms. Next question. Now, when we look at menopausal symptoms, it might be with respect to psychological symptoms, it might be with respect to physical symptoms, it might be with respect to reproductive symptoms. All of this we see that menopause, the fundamental understanding is where the reproductive capacity of an individual ends there. Right, so that is an indicative feature of again a transition, transitioning moves, moving towards the aging phenomena. So all of those dimensions can be written, right? Then apart from that, one more question where most of the aspirants thought it was a little difficult that is the William Ogburns and the cultural lag. That's what at the initial aspect I was discussing. That cultural lag is what when I see the technological changes and when I see the ideological changes when there is a lag between the technological and ideological changes. When I observe this technological and ideological changes to be lagging when the technology is advancing but the ideological changes is not happening to a larger extent. That means where I see some caste system still being followed in urban centers. Although I see technologically developed, although I see a fast moving pace of life is being present in urbanization or in urban centers but I don't see a necessary match or I don't see a necessary catch up which is existing with respect to both of the systems. So that is what is one thing that you have to understand with respect to William Ogman that is urbanization without urbanism as a phenomena simplest understanding is what is one fundamental thing here. Next, sixth question. Now again this particular question has been troubling discuss the controversies related to field work of Malinowski and Margaret Mead. We know Malinowski fundamentally belonged to the cultural functionalist school when we look at Margaret Mead culture personality school. Although we know the basic things but when you look at the fundamental criticism that is seen in the context of Malinowski, we see when you look at the diaries that were published by the wife of Malinowski, we see that there was a kind of indifferent behavior that was seen from the side of Malinowski with respect to the field work in which he was engaging. Right? So that kind of criticism can be written. Then apart from that when we look at Margaret Mead, we know one individual categorically criticizes or the whole of the field work of one individual is categorically on criticizing Margaret Mead, that is Derek Freeman. Now Derek Freeman categorically criticizes Margaret Mead. Now he says that whole of the study on the coming of age of Samoans was fundamentally on, basic of, on basis of certain assumptions. And he says that there was a strict virginity complex which was followed in the age of or in this Samoan society. So which is completely against Margaret Mead. So it, number of such controversies are fundamentally existing in this context, right? So that has to be written here. Now when you look at discuss the impact of globalization on economic systems, a straightforward question from your economic anthropology that you'll have to, right? Next, discuss the practical applications of DNA technology in current scenario. You can talk about medicine, you can talk about forensics, or you can talk about industries, right? You can talk about vaccine development. So all of these systems fundamentally, it might be in the context of diagnosis, it might be in the context of treatment, it might be in the context of industrial products which are to be produced. All of these dimensions can be seen with respect to the DNA technology, right? So that is what is the thing with respect to that particular question. Then seventh question. Now when we look at seventh question, describe various methods of qualitative data analysis. Now qualitative data analysis might be the phenomenological studies, or might be the interview, or might be the participant observation. All of these are qualitative studies with respect to the research methodologies that we study in chapter 8. Now once we understand this, they are also asking about highlight some popular computer softwares. Now for example, some softwares like Atlas, some softwares like Hyper Research, some softwares like InVivo, right? All of these are some of the softwares which are categorically used for this qualitative analysis, right? It's, it's more of an out-of-box question which is seen, which fundamentally troubles most of the aspirants, 
right? But considering that we already have a choice to attempt to different questions in this particular paper. Next, moving to what assumptions must be met for a population to be in genetic equilibrium. Now, this is one form of talking about Hardy Weinberg law. This is one form of talking about Hardy Weinberg law because Hardy Weinberg law categorically talks about genetic equilibrium. He talks about random mating, he talks about no mutation, no selection, no, no gene flow. There are five different parameters or five different assumptions which are categorically talked about this. And understanding the importance or the relevance of Hardy Weinberg law, we get to understand how are the evolutionary forces which are acting upon a particular region. We know Faulkner has talked about the different evolutionary forces. They might be dispersive forces, they might be systematic forces or systemic forces. We see that how are these two different forces which are fundamentally acting upon a particular evolutionary process can be studied by understanding the genetic equilibrium. So that is one thing that you will have to understand here. Next moving on further, discuss political and methodological aspects with respect to nation character studies, NCS. Now we know that most of the individuals who were related to the culture personality school had studied this particular national character studies. Now in that context it might be with respect to Russian studies, it might be German studies or it might be Japan studies or it might be US studies. We see one common phenomenon that we understand is how is the character that is related to a particular nation. And in that context we see that one fundamental understanding that can be seen is it might be how is its contemporary relevance. When you look at the contemporary relevance, it is to understand the personality, it is to profile the personality of the individuals who are moving from a particular region to one more region. It enables you to study the behavior of the migrant population. It enables you to study, have a derivative tool for a particular diplomatic engagement. So all of this is what is one kind of contemporary relevance that is existing with respect to this particular studies. Next moving further, the last question of the paper, eighth question, we see that critically examine Arjun Appadurai's conceptualization of global and global cultural economy. Now when we look at this Arjun Appadurai's globalization concept, it is little off stream, more of a so, uh, sociology as an optional, the people who study sociology as an optional might know about Arjun Appadurai. But you will also have to understand that we study globalization as a phenomena in number of areas. In number of areas. And in that context, when you have certain basic understanding, because it's more of a dynamic concept, it's more of a current oriented concept. And he's one of the famous Indian anthropologists who has dif different studies on globalization. Now when we look at the globalization studies by Arjun Appadurai, he gives a book, Disruptive and Difference in Global Cultures. Disruptive and differences in global cultures. That means when you look at this studies, he talks about the concept of scapes. And he talks about the concept of scapes or he talks about the concept of the cultural flow. And he says that any globalization that is occurring in a particular region, it is not wholesome, it is not comprehensive, but it is selective in nature. It is selective in nature. It is more of a selective globalization which is happening in the context of India. And when we look at this selective globalization which is happening in the context of India, what do we observe? He says that we have different kinds of scapes or we have different kinds of cultural flows which are existing. It might be in the context of ethnoscape, that is with respect to some culture. Or it might be with respect to ideoscape, that might be with respect to the ideological flow. Or it might be with respect to financial scape, it might be with respect to certain economic transactions and economic interactions which are existing. Or it might be with respect to technoscape, the flow of technology. The flow of technology or the media scape. He talks about these five different scapes which are existing with respect to globalization as a phenomenon. His understanding about the globalization is not comprehensive globalization but more of a selective, selective globalization which is existing in the context of India. So that is what is Arjun Appadurai studies in the context of globalization. Next, describe the causes of structural abnormalities. We know in any chromosomal abnormalities we have two different kinds of abnormalities which are existing. One is the numerical, the other one is structural. Now when you look at the numerical, it might be a nuploidy, euploidy, or it might be with respect to the, <coughs> it might be with respect to your Edwards syndrome, or Down syndrome, or Patau syndrome. All of these are what, those which are related to the number. It might be because of the non-disjunction. Or it might be because of improper cell division which is happening to a larger extent. So all of this or it might be anaphase lagging can be a reason for such kind of numerical aberrations. But when we look at the structural aberrations it might be inversion. 
translocation robertsonian translocation is what we study so all of these are what structural kind of abnormalities a direct question from 9.4 we know this is one of the very very favorite areas that is with respect to abnormalities now the last question of the paper it is asking about the critically discuss al crowbar's contribution to the kinship studies now it is asking about A.L. Grover's contribution towards kinship study and when we look at the understanding of A.L. Grover, we see that psychology becomes a reason for all. And when we look at the psychology becomes a reason for all, psychology becomes a reason for behavior. And not only that the psychology becomes a reason for behavior, we also see psychology becomes a reason for language and not only with respect to the language but we also see from this, we, here we see the emergence of kinship terminologies. And Clover is also known for giving the eight determinants of kinship, right? So that is what is to be discussed in this particular question. Okay, now to summarize it all with respect to what learnings can we have with respect to this one, ensure that your PYQs are revised, ensure that you have a detailed understanding about your PYQs at least, maintaining the conceptual clarity, maintaining the revision notes, maintaining the necessary substantiations and research articles and dynamics and the contemporary field works with respect to your PYQs. All of this is what is the way forward that you will have to understand when it comes to moving ahead for preparing for 2024 mains examination. Thank you.